Hi, I'm Sam with jbugs.com. In our last video, we started bolting on all the components that will complete our 1800cc stroker engine. We took a break after getting the intake manifold set in place, and today we'll pick up where we left off. We'll get the rest of the serpentine belt kit components bolted on, install flange heater boxes, a two-tip GT exhaust system, and all the remaining parts we'll need to make a turnkey engine. We start by installing a pulley spacer on the crankshaft, which will offset the pulley so it lines up with the serpentine belt tensioner. The new crank pulley is then tapped into place, followed by a crank pulley bolt and washer. The bolt is tightened with a 30 millimeter socket or large crescent wrench. At the alternator, a spacer is slid over the shaft before installing the pulley keyway. The new alternator pulley is installed next, followed by a lock washer and nut. The tensioner pulley bolt is unthreaded from the adjuster bracket, so we can pull off the pulley and install the serpentine belt. Then the pulley and bolt are threaded back into the bracket. The tensioner pulley bolt has a decorative cap that is held in place with an Allen set screw. With it removed, the bolt can be tightened to the bracket and the cap can be set back in place. The bracket is adjusted by loosening the two Allen screws and sliding the pulley and bracket towards the belt to tighten. With the belt tight, the two bracket bolts are tightened, and next we'll install the spark plug wires. We start with the longer 1-2 wires, which are routed behind the intake manifold. This required removing the dust seals and the center plug wire holder on the shroud, as it's a very tight fit. The boots are reinstalled, and the wires are plugged under the distributor cap. The 3-4 wires are shorter and much easier to route and install. The wires are pressed into the spark plug wire holders on the fan shroud, once they are routed and in place. We don't fully install the wires at the plugs as the plugs will be coming out before we start the engine. At our workbench, we'll prep our new Protronics low resistance coil, which is needed for our Protronics Igniter 3 SVDA distributor. We install push-on electrical terminals at both the threaded studs. On the positive terminal, we'll install a triple push-on connector as we need a terminal for the positive ignition wire, the coil wire, and the electronic ignition. On the negative terminal, we install a double connector for the electronic ignition and attack lead. Then at the engine, the coil is bolted to the fan shroud and the coil wire is connected. Now the engine is rotated so that the one two cylinder head is up so we can thread on the thermostat. It is threaded all the way in, then backed off so the flat edges are perpendicular to the engine case. Then the thermostat bracket is set in place over the thermostat, aligning the bracket with the flat edges on the thermostat, and then the engine case mounting stud. A bolt and large diameter washer are used to attach the thermostat to the bracket. Then at the case, a nut and washer are threaded on, and the bracket is slid up on the case to close the flaps, and the nut is tightened. The flat heater channel tin is screwed to the curved heater channel tin, at the hole closest to the case and to the engine case. Our case was stripped out here, so we tapped it to an 8 by 125 millimeter and used an appropriate sized Allen bolt. Now all the exhaust studs are threaded into the cylinder heads and new exhaust gaskets are installed at the back exhaust ports. Now we'll weld some flanges onto our two-tip exhaust system to match our one and a half inch flange performance heater boxes. A heater box is bolted to a used cylinder head. Then the exhaust is bolted to the opposite side lower stud and rotated so it sits next to the flange of the heater box. The exhaust pipe is cut with a sawzall in line with the heater box flange. The exhaust is removed from the head. The pipe is sanded down to remove the paint. A weld on flange is slid over the pipe and the exhaust is bolted back to the head at both studs. The new flange is bolted to the heater box and the flange is welded to the exhaust pipe. The same process is repeated on the opposite side pipe using the opposite heater box and flipping the cylinder head around. The heater boxes are slid onto the exhaust ports and low profile 12 point nuts are threaded down loosely to hold the heater box in place. The nuts are not going to be tightened down yet. New exhaust gassets are installed at the front exhaust ports. The modified exhaust is set in place over the studs and low profile nuts 
are loosely threaded down to hold it in place. Because we have a stroker engine, the heads sit a little farther apart than stock, so the exhaust pipe at one opposite head needs to be pulled slightly to line it up over the studs. Now, exhaust gaskets are slid in between the heater box and the exhaust flanges, and the bolts for the flanges are installed along with low profile nuts. With both heater box to exhaust pipe connections tight, the nuts at the head for the heater boxes are tightened down, and the long tabs from the heater boxes are screwed into the heater channels. At the back of the fan shroud, the thermostat bar is installed to connect the left and right flaps, and the return spring is installed from the fan shroud to the crossbar. And now is a good time to make sure that you've installed the screw from the fan shroud to the hoover bit if your engine still has the hoover bit. The lower doghouse exit duct is installed at the back of the fan shroud, followed by the upper duct. The doghouse front engine tin has a cutout for the exit duct and bolts to the left and right cylinder shrouds, but can't be bolted in place currently as the engine is bolted to our engine stand. Then at the front of the engine, after making sure that the heat riser ports on our exhausts are drilled out, we install the left and right intake manifold preheat tubes which slide into small holes under the intake manifold at the left and right sides. The tubes line up with the heat riser flanges at the number two and four exhaust ports and are essential to keep the intake manifold from icing up. Gaskets are set in between the flange and the tube and nuts and bolts are installed and tightened down to secure the connection. At the carburetor, we unthread the fuel inlet line and swap it out with a plug at the front of the carburetor. This will allow the fuel line to come around the front of the carburetor as there is not much clearance behind the carb in the intake manifold. Now we can set the rear engine tin in place and we can show how the intake preheat pipe would install through the tin, lining it up with a notch in the cylinder deflect tin and it would attach to the lower exhaust stud if we were using it. We won't be though, so we need to block the hole in the engine tin. Cardboard and a marker are used to make a template the template is used as a guide, and we cut a piece of sheet metal that we bolted in place to the tin and block the hole. With the rear engine tin pulled, the screw for the deflect tin that is closest to the exhaust port is tightened after making sure that the opposite end nut insert lines up with the cylinder shroud and breastplate. Then the rear engine tin is set in place on the engine again and loosely screwed in place to the breastplate and to the left and right cylinder shrouds. Next, we install the preheat pipe tins at the left and right cylinder shrouds. And with all the screws lined up and loosely threaded in place, they're all tightened. Since we'll be breaking in our engine on the stand, we'll install an oil filter bracket by using a long bolt at the outer engine tin screw at the left of the engine. We aren't using a stock muffler, but we are using heater boxes, so aluminum fresh air fan shroud hoses are routed down through the rear engine tin, hooked up to the heater boxes, and shaped around the exhaust tubes. Fresh air hose seals are then slid over the hoses and pushed down to the rear engine tin and the hose is slid in place onto the fan shroud. At the right of the engine, the air hose has to be clearanced for the oil filler breather hose. The oil filler breather hose is attached to the port on the bottom of the air cleaner we installed earlier and pushed into place onto the oil filler. Next, we install the fuel line, and since we want to check the fuel pressure as we're installing a new fuel pump, we have a test line set up with an inline pressure gauge. The e-gas carburetor has a much larger than stock 5 16 inch inlet, so we use 7 millimeter hose at the carburetor. We use the cutoff end of an old plastic fuel filter to step it down the fuel line to 5 millimeter, and that hose is routed to the bottom outlet port. Since we'll be running our engine on the bench, we don't have a front engine tin in place to run the stock metal fuel line through. So we use a long length of 5mm fuel hose and attach it to the top inlet port at the fuel pump. A length of 3.5mm vacuum hose is pressed in place for the vacuum port on the carburetor, trimmed to length, and attached to the vacuum diaphragm on the distributor. For safety's sake, we zip tie the fuel hose from the pump to the carburetor to the distributor clip to prevent the line from dragging on the alternator pulley. Now we prep the oil filter adapter and apply brew thread rocker to the filter threaded boss and the hose barbs. 
and thread them into the adapter and tighten the hose barbs with the wrench. Assembly lube is applied to the sealing ring on the oil filter and the oil filter is threaded onto the adapter. Do not over tighten the filter. Once the filter contacts the seal, turn it a half turn and it's tight. The length of oil hose we had attached to the oil pump and return is pulled off of the return, routed up to the inlet of the oil filler adapter, and trimmed to length. Hose clamps are slid onto the hose before it is attached to the filter adapter, and the clamps are both tightened. The remaining section of hose is used to attach the outlet of the filter to the return on the engine case after trimming it to length, and hose clamps are used to secure the hose at both ends. Then the threaded hose fitting is tightened to the return of the adapter. We install the rear engine tin block off plate with a trimmed and bent off piece of sheet metal that we fabricated from the template we made earlier. The teardrop shaped piece of metal has a long tab that we cut and bent to slide under the large hole in the tin. The smaller hole secures the other end with a tin screw that attaches at the breastplate. Finally, the wires from the electronic ignition are routed to the coil, trimmed to length, stripped, and quarter inch terminal ends are crimped onto the ends. The red wire is plugged onto the positive terminal of the coil. The black wire is plugged onto the negative terminal. It is important to note that the original Volkswagen wire from the main harness at the coil is black and goes to the opposite positive side of the coil. We've only removed the coil to emphasize the position of the wires. And with that, we're just about ready to fire our engine for its break and run. We'll cover that process in our next video, where we'll fill the engine with oil, pull the push rods and plugs, crank the engine over to build oil pressure before we install the push rods and rockers, the plugs, and fire the engine up for the first time. In the meantime, check out some of our other tech and how-to videos, and when it's time to order parts for your vintage Volkswagen, head over to jbugs.com.